Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bipolar Awakenings podcast with me, Sean Blackwell. And today I'll be talking to Dr. Katrina Michelle. Katrina is a holistic psychotherapist and founder of The Curious Spirit, who specializes in spiritual emergence and psychedelic integration. Katrina's dissertation on the resistance to spiritual emergence was pivotal in both catalyzing and supporting integration of her own spiritual emergence. She is the former executive director of ASSIST, which stands for the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences, and is also a former director of the MAPS Zendo Project, MAPS being the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. You've probably heard of them. Currently, Katrina is collaborating with a team of researchers to explore adverse psychedelic experiences and is working on producing a film, When Lightning Strikes, which is intended to illustrate the often unsexy side of awakening. Katrina and I have known each other for quite a while online, and I thought she'd be a great person to catch up with. Okay, so Katrina, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Sean. Good to be with you. Yeah, and we mentioned in the introduction that you'd had a spiritual emergence, which you see as different from a spiritual emergency. Do you want to tell us about your experience there? and Sure. How you got on your adventure? Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to share. And I'll preface this by saying that at the time, I didn't know this was a spiritual emergence. Uh, at the time, I was a 20-something college student, and I was not engaged in any spiritual practices or use of any substances. And I was uh, just going about my day, coming off of the subway into New York City. And there I was, a few steps off of the subway onto the sidewalk, and I was suddenly swept away by this beautiful experience of interconnection, love, empathy for my fellow humans around me, a sense of understanding the intimate interconnection of the universe, the oneness that we all share. It really defies language for me to try to explain this to you, but what I can say is as quickly as it consumed me, it was gone. And there I was again, back in my body, so to speak, continuing to walk down the sidewalk, suddenly finding myself wondering what the heck just happened. Um, and, you know, at the time I had no framework for this. I didn't have language. I didn't have anyone I would even begin to try to speak with this about. I wasn't in therapy. I didn't have any mature and sensitive adults that I could discuss this with. Um, so it just kind of went away into the recesses of my memory. And it stayed with me so much so that when I would periodically recall it, it would bring me to tears. It was such a beautiful, blissful state. And I didn't know what to do with it. So it just kind of faded into the background. And then Fast forward, years later, I am practicing as a therapist. I decided to go back to school to study transpersonal psychology. Um, and I suddenly realized when I get there, oh, I'm actually here to talk about this experience. And looking back now, I realized that it was going back to school that was actually what gave me not only the language for this experience, I now use Dan Groff's language of the unit of experience to describe this. Um, but it also served as the opportunity for me to integrate the experience. And I did that by becoming intimately aware of my own process and catalyzing what I think begun back then, uh, catalyzed me into a process which happened through the course of my research there at Sophia University. And it's become my my work and my calling to really not only share my story, but encourage other people to share their stories of spiritual emergence, spiritual awakening, and sometimes spiritual emergency, which is, uh, you know, the question you had asked me to distinguish between the two. Um, for me... Yeah, sure. But yeah. let's, just, let's just clarify a couple of things before mm -hmm. we 
get on there. So you weren't hospitalized or anything like that, right? No, no. Yeah, didn't have to see a psychiatrist or anything. No, and th yeah, and that's why I say it wasn't a spiritual emergency because I uh, I just right. somehow successfully pushed it to the back of my mind. And, and I did have the thought, well, oh, maybe this is the beginning of a psychotic break. You know, I know I'm at the age, I was a psychology major at the time. And I just sort of thought, well, maybe one day this will happen to me. Um, and fortunately, it didn't ever turn into anything like that. But um, yeah, but I was I was fortunate in that no, I, it was fleeting and momentary, and it didn't turn into any prolonged episode. Okay, but you were studying psychology at university, huh? I was at, yes. at the time. At the time, yes, when this at the time when this happened. So that was the only framework I had. And what kind of framework did you get from university? Like. Were you studying young? What What was your psychology I, background? From well, no, at the time I was just an undergraduate student and I was studying, you know, basic general psychology. And so uh, we were learning through the DSM model and I understood that I was in the age range where people can have their first psychotic break. And so my analytical mind, once, once I was coming back into my body and into my surroundings in the 3D world, the first thing I started to do was try to place what just happened to me. And all I could use as a framework was that DSM model that I was learning in school. So I assumed, okay, well, I was maybe what, 20, 21. So yeah, this is about the time where a break might happen. And this might be something I have to deal with as life goes on. And, uh, it never came up after that, but that was that was my assumption at the time. All right. Did you um, you were so you were taught about the potential for a psychotic break when you're in university? Did they ever teach you about spiritual experiences or experience of oneness or oh, or that being part of potential psychosis? Did they ever talk about that? They did not. No, they they definitely did not. Um, I'm not even sure that they really taught us what you know, what psychosis was, I think it was a very removed point of view at the time. There wasn't any attempt at giving us a phenomenological understanding of what somebody might be going through, only how they would be presenting to others. Mm. And what did you think about your behavior that might have been presenting to others as psychotic? Was there anything there or was it sort of just? Yeah, I mean, it was a very internal thing. I, I couldn't tell you what happened in the eyes of the people around me that day. But my understanding is I kept walking down the street and I just I was in a dissociated place, I guess, where I was having an inner experience that was otherworldly. But to the bystanders around me, I'm sure I just looked like everybody else. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, yeah, and and I had a kind of similar experience um, before I was hospitalized, two years earlier than when I was hospitalized. Went to Vancouver, and then all of a sudden colors got brighter, and I felt more alive. It sort of ended seven years of depression for me, and there was tons of synchronicities, but I didn't know what was going on. It was, and I and I had, I started reading all these new age books to sort of try and catch up to where I was where I was at psychologically, you know? Yeah. So how did, so it sounds like you took quite a bit of time to integrate this experience. It was like a momentary experience, but then it obviously changed your life completely. You know, yeah, it, powerful. It, it was super powerful. It was, you know, to this day, I've still had no experience like here. And that was 20 something years ago, but it, it definitely stayed with me. It was so um, completely unusual and, beautiful and blissful you know even just recalling it now my heart feels like it's it's opening like it's bringing in some of that some of that sense memory um yeah wow. so it stayed with me although i wouldn't say i could integrate it because in order to integrate you you need to have some language and some context and i didn't have that so it really just it went into the background of my life and it just became that interesting transcendent experience that happened once um, but I never mentioned it because I, I truly did not even have language to frame it until I started at this PhD program where I suddenly realized, oh, 
I can talk about this here. And that was, you know, 15 years later after the fact. And how did you get into this PhD program? What was the story that took you there? Because it was Sophia University, right? Right. Yeah. So it was, it was at the time it was the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. And uh, while I was there, they, they changed their name. But uh, yeah, the, the story there was that, uh, so this school really just showed up for me. That actually showed up for me years earlier when I was first graduating college and knew that I had wanted to study something sort of along the lines of psychology, spirituality, philosophical inquiry, but I didn't really have a sense of what that was. And, you know, I grew up in New York. I went to school in New York. That world didn't seem to exist where I was. And uh, I had been doodling in notebooks, you know, as I was going about life. And when I finally came across this school, the Institute of Transversal Psychology, I realized I had been doodling the symbol for the school in my notebooks. And it was just like a powerful wow moment of, okay, there, there's something interesting happening here, but I didn't go to school at that time. At the time I chose instead to go and get my master's in social work, telling myself, well, what are you gonna do with a degree in transpersonal psychology? You need to get a job so you can move out of your parents' house. Story, story of my life. What are you gonna do with that degree? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, it took so you went to go back. So, so you did do the masters. I did the MSW first, and you know went that whole traditional route and got lots of experience. And then it was uh, it was when I was already in a private practice and um, felt like I needed to kind of do something else for myself. So I was like, oh, you know what? Let me look back into the school. And I had some other synchronicities that just started to align for me that brought the school back into the forefront of my mind. Interestingly, I'll I'll share this experience. Um, Jim Fadiman, who is one of the founders of the Institute of Transversal Psychology, now Sophia. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I had been at a retreat at Omega Institute and uh, it was there that I realized, you know, I think it's time for me to go back to school. I always said, you know, one day I'll go back and do my PhD, but it wasn't on my mind. And then at that retreat, it kind of came up again. So by the time I came home, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get home. I'm going to go online. I'm going to start looking into making this happen. And as I'm driving home, um, this is in New York. I was just about coming off the highway to go toward where I was living in Queens at the time. And I suddenly remembered, I was like, oh yeah, there's some kind of a lecture happening at the Open Center tonight, which is New York City. It was probably a Sunday evening. I'm just coming from this retreat. And I just literally turned my car back around, got back on the highway and went into the city. And if you know New York City at all or any big city, you know it's highly unusual to find a parking spot directly in front of where you're going. And okay, yeah. I literally pulled, Yeah, like it, so I literally pulled up into a parking spot directly in front of the doors, walk into the the course. It was like a one-off course. And Again, just vaguely knew there was a title of a workshop that interested me. And I get there right on time. And who's talking? But hi, this, you know, I'm Jim Sadman, and this is my book, and I'm the founder of Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. And it was just like, wow, what? I did not know that at the time. I didn't make the connection because I, you know, I hadn't really researched who was who there, but it was just another sign that I was going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you mentioned the Open Center. And for people who don't know, um, who are, don't know New York, the Omega Center is like a kind of a new age hub for all kinds of courses in you near know, the Catskills or something. Is it? Uh, yeah, the, the Hudson Valley, I think. Yeah, yeah, right back Valley. New York. Okay, so mm -hmm. north of New York, New York City, and then the in the Open Center, I made a video for Dr. David Lukoff after he had had a spiritual emergency, and he had. A uh, synchronistic thing happened at the Open Center as well, where um, he he met a teacher there, and he was talking about his experience, and she introduced him to the idea of I think she introduced him to the idea of spiritual emergency or something like that. I'm not wow. entirely clear. Um, and of course, he he taught at uh, the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology so yeah. as well. So look at that! I love that. Those links. Fascinating. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. And so you mentioned, uh, you, you, you said that 
what you did. You you studied spiritual emergency at Sophia. Is that right? So I yeah. So so I started off in the research program, not really sure what I was going to research, but knowing that I didn't need the clinical degree because I already had my clinical social work license. Um, and I was I was interested in the just general topic of consciousness and human development. And I didn't have the language or spiritual emergence until I got there. And as soon as I did, I was like, oh, this is this is what I'm interested in. This is what I've always been trying to put my finger on, but nobody could offer it back to me. Um, so to have that kind of offered in the consciousness of this really at the time, it was a really beautiful school, um, just very heart centered and aligned and focused on not just mental academic education, but whole person immersive learning. And so I, I dove in and started to realize, okay, I wanted to learn more about spiritual emergence and uh, began to do my dissertation work toward uh, really illuminating this concept of spiritual resistance, which uh, I proposed was what happens when we have some sort of an emergent experience and we don't know what to do with it so we put it away and the reasons we put Isn't it that away what you did you, you oh, yeah you put yours exactly. away i absolutely put mine away because what was i going to do with it you know who was i going to tell what were they going to say you know what, what were they going to reflect back to me i'm so glad i didn't yeah, share like, that with anyone <laughs> you're so glad right because yeah, what was <laughs> oh what could have happened what were you afraid of happening yeah, I mean, well, looking back and now knowing what I know, I mean, I could have probably been sent for a psychiatric evaluation. I could have been given medication I didn't need. They could have really, you know, created some trouble for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, without any cultural context, it's really a, a situation of you've got to be careful who you speak to, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so where did you get that support? In integral what's the actual yeah that's um well sophia itp sophia yeah okay yeah so I, you know i get called sophia yeah we'll call sophia it's sophia now um all right so yeah i uh i guess for me my it was a very gradual realization and through the the model of research that i was using was called heuristic inquiry and that asked that the researcher be in their own process with the data within themselves with in addition to working with the data from their participants. So in other words, I was interviewing people about their experiences of resistance within their spiritual emergence. And I was also looking at myself for any information in my own process. So it was through that process of working with other people, being engaged in my own process, that I started to recognize I was integrating some opening that I had, you know, 10, 15 years earlier. And that went on to catapult me being, you know, uh, able to make significant changes in my life that were just much more aligned with who I was. You know, I left my marriage. I, um, you know, really came out of the closet about being interested in this in terms of my practice um, and started to speak publicly about not only my experience, but became an advocate for supporting others who might be going through similar experiences so that they don't get pathologized and they don't get put on medication. They're given an opportunity to explore alternate frames and meaning making for something that could be a very generative uh, potential. Mm -hmm. And did you, in that period, how, how long was it? Did you say 15 years between the time yeah. and the time you were met? Uh, about, with Sophia? about that, yeah. I, could, I don't know the actual exact year that, that I had that experience, but it was at least it was it was more than a decade it was probably like 12 to 15 years something like that and during that decade did you know you were holding back did you have an awareness that you were holding back? ah good question i i think i think sort of but i didn't know it was related to that experience i think i was very caught in doing what you're supposed to do as uh, a young adult in the world trying to find my way getting mm -hmm. the job getting the husband not knowing that you know or actually i was i did know there was something deeper but i didn't find resonance with anybody or anything around me i was living a very insulated life and there was just nothing for me to latch on to to begin that process of discovery okay so you're just ticking all the boxes doing exactly. what you're supposed to do did you yeah. enjoy being a social worker 
I did. Yeah. I mean, I really did. I, en- I enjoyed the, the work, but I, I knew early on that I, I was calling myself a holistic uh, psychotherapist when I, when I first started my practice, because I had learned enough from working in the uh, inpatient psychiatric unit and community mental health. I knew enough that I didn't really buy the whole medical model. And I figured, well, people that want to work with me, they're going to make meaning of holistic however they want to, and we're going to work outside the box. So with that, we were able to um, make the work meaningful for me too. Interesting. Yeah, because uh, you've probably had experience with a lot of therapists who have an orientation completely different than your own. Oh, absolutely. Maybe I should use that too. Maybe I should use that. I should say I'm a holistic therapist. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you are, right? I mean, certainly you're somebody working with altered states in a constructive way. That's not what mainstream people will do. I actually hate it when people ask me what I do because I don't really know how to frame it. I'm sure people will get get misunderstood either way, you know? Yeah, but anyways... um, so you start to sort of come out at Sophia and you get more. Oh, did you, did you enjoy being married? <laughs> you know, it, uh, I learned a lot. Let's just leave it there. <laughs> okay. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it was, it was a necessary part of my process in my case. And, and also it was, it was keeping me stuck in a life that wasn't really the life I wanted. So having the realization that I needed to spread my wings, you know, I needed to be met in a different way. And my partner wasn't somebody who had the capacity to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and then there's going to Sophia, there's this New York to LA move kind of thing, right? Or New York (laughs) to San Francisco. Yeah, New York to the Bay. Yeah, and I was actually I was actually in their local program, so I was able to maintain uh, my practice in New York while I was going to the Bay Area every couple of months to do the retreats there, and I ended up spending more time there once I really dove into my research. And yeah, but that for sure, it was a big cultural shift. I felt much more met with the Bay Area consciousness than I did. And I might say still do in New York, although I do think that's changing, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a hard time in Manhattan. Stresses me out. Yeah. Very confrontational. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. It was more, even, yeah, yeah. I'm from Toronto, which has a bit of that East Coast vibe. Uh-huh. But when I moved to Vancouver, I kind of preferred it out there. Although it didn't yeah. have, I was missing a bit of that edge, but right. um, Vancouver was still a better, better environment for me. Yeah. So then what were you studying at Sophia? You were studying spiritual. So, emergence. so yeah. So I, I, uh, I was doing my research on spiritual emergence as it related to how we resist the process of spiritual resist or spiritual emergence. Mm-hmm. And so what were you finding? What were some of your findings? Yeah, well, I guess what I came to understand was that the resistance has its place. You know, it can be inhibiting, but it can also be protective. And that's really what all defense mechanisms do for us, right? They they shield us for something we might not be ready for. But once those defenses aren't needed anymore, if that defense mechanism is still used, it's really keeping us from um, forward motion. And in in my case, and in the case of spiritual resistance, it keeps people from really emerging into the fullness of themselves. So the resistance of the process can come in because people are confused, they're afraid, they don't understand, they have no context. Um, Some people have transpersonal experiences that ask them to quit their jobs, to work being in service, to give away their money, you know? So uh, it can be very, talk about confronting, it can be very confronting and challenging. And so people often feel like they need to resist going into that experience because it will create havoc in their lives. And it will, right? Uh, We know that especially an intense process of spiritual emergence, which we might frame more as a spiritual emergency, It will destroy everything you know. It will invite you to strip it all down and become the most authentic version of you. And sadly, that's not always easy, especially when we live in a culture who doesn't get it. Yeah. I remember when I was younger, you know, I think at university, and my parents were quite, oh, 
little free free with me. I could really do whatever I wanted. I wasn't at the time the person was cooped up, but they would always say like, well, as long as you stay on track, you know, like as long as you're on the right track. And, um, and that meant doing well in school and, mm -hmm. you know, not falling into drugs and that kind of thing. And one day I came home and I, I said, mom, I, I think, I think the problem is the track. I think the track <laughs> is the, the problem. You know, I, I think I'm supposed to get off this track entirely, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, 15 years later, that's pretty much what happened. But when you're being groomed from birth for yeah. family and career and survival, mm -hmm. then just sort of jumping off of that um, for any amount of financial sacrifice is considered crazy. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that's why, you know, I think it's, we need a cultural shift, right? We need, we need more than just the select individuals to recognize the change. We need to create structures that normalize us living in alignment with what we're asked to be doing from our higher selves from these experiences, which I believe are coming from our, you know, the seeds of inspiration from our higher selves. You know, we all have this potential within us and these experiences can really open us into enacting those potentials. But if we resist it so much because our cultures don't give us permission, we really stifle who we're supposed to be in the world. And to me, that's tragic, tragic. Mm -hmm, mm hmm for sure. And, you know, for me going on to YouTube in 2007 yeah. was like a big step because I was working mostly as an English teacher here in Brazil, which was right. perfectly fine. I was perfectly happy. Then all this stuff started. Then I got on YouTube and I'm talking about being in the psychiatric hospital in public. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty rare at the time. My parents were mortified. <coughs> um, but it took me on this direction and most of my life is pretty intuitive, which largely explains why I never have a whole lot of money, <laughs> but, yeah. but even, even, even with the podcast, it's, um, I don't know where this podcast thing is going. I, I don't really know what I'm doing with it. I've got no sort of strategy, but I really enjoyed the conversations with the people mm -hmm. I've been talking to. I found them very interesting and I, and I thought that they would reach out to other people who sort of have the same interests, you know? Yeah. And it's important yeah. because, yeah. And I mean, to me, for you to be doing that in 2007, you know, you were really shaping the culture, you know, from, you know, that was way before this was on my radar, but how beautiful that people were starting to catch on to alternative perspectives from the work that you put out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. And, and, you know, I, I went, a year after I got out of the psychiatric hospital, I went to Peru, you know, for a shamanic mm -hmm. tour, you know, yeah. Machu Picchu, and we met these Incan shaman and the whole bit. And now that's all like status and people put that on their Instagram mm -hmm. and all this kind of thing. When I went, I didn't tell anybody at the office where I was going. This my <laughs> boss knew yeah. I was going yeah. through everybody else. I'm going on vacation. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. No big, f I didn't even take it. I didn't take a camera to Peru. Did not take a camera. Wow. Because I thought, well, this is going to be an inner experience and we'll see what happens, you know? Yeah. So that's kind and of how was, my uh... world operates. Yeah. 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 Met my wife there. I wouldn't be Great. in Brazil if it wasn't for going to Peru, you know? Beautiful. Yeah. So you're doing this research on spiritual emergence when you're at Sofia and then you graduate. So then what happens? Yeah, so while I was at Sophia, I had begun um, volunteering with ASSIST. Uh, that was around the time they had their first conference in 2012, I believe it was. And uh, yeah, I was really just excited that there was a way to begin bringing my studies out into the real world. I uh, really was wondering if I was in a bubble. So for this organization to be existing, that was intending to support people having these experiences and also intending to train the professionals who work with them it was really right up my alley and uh yeah i was invited to join the board and once i graduated i went on to become executive director and supported the organization in offering conferences annually to train professionals as well as maintaining a forum for peers to come on and share their experiences with one another and get support and 
yeah, it was, it was a really rich time to be able to begin to make that bridge between the academic world, which I was concerned I would be stuck in forever without any understand, anyone else understanding, and to make that bridge into the, re- the, yeah, the so-called real world, coming back out, and uh, yeah. Would you, were you paid for that job, or was it a volunteer thing? I was not paid for it. Yeah, it was uh, not paid. Yeah, there sadly were, were not too many people willing to give money to a small nonprofit interested in studying transpersonal experiences. <laughs> but uh, but it was a labor of love. It really was. And uh, I put a lot of energy, effort, time, and passion into it. And um, and yeah, I'm really grateful that I had the experience. got to witness a lot of uh, beautiful people going through their experiences and hopefully it made some difference in expanding the world views of providers who are, you know, going to be encountering people coming to them in their practices who are going through such experiences. Yeah. Did you get people coming to you that had received a diagnosis, for example, of bipolar and that kind of thing? Or Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think anyone who has seen a mental health provider they would have a diagnosis, right? Because mental health providers, sadly, the system that we operate on, if you want the insurance company to pay your bill, you need to give them a, a diagnosis that tells them that there's something pathological going on. So, wow. Yeah. Well, let me just repeat that. If you want the insurance company to pay the bill, then the, the, the therapist, the psychologist or psychiatrist almost has a, a mandate to diagnose them with something yeah. And the DSM, that Bible. Yes. You've got to exactly. get away with the diagnosis or else nobody gets paid. Exactly. Whoa. I never really thought of it that way. I, I mean, I knew there was a, I knew the whole system is kind of working against us. But when you put <laughs> it in such black and white terms that you must get a diagnosis or else. Yeah. Wow. That's disturbing. Yes. Right. Or else why are you coming to therapy? Because we know people can't be in therapy for growth. They're only in therapy because something's wrong with you. Oh, yeah. It, it, I'm kind of surprised that a th- social work environment or a therapeutic environment still thinks that way. Because that's, that's the way I used to think when I was 25. Mm-hmm. Oh, if you're in therapy, it's because you're not normal. You have a problem. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I don't know that they still think that way. I think it's just that the systems take a long time to change. And, you know, you're speaking of Dr. Lukoff earlier, and we all know he came up with the DSM code um, that allowed us to at least qualify that somebody's anxiety might be coming from having a quote, spiritual or religious problem. Uh, So that was a good start, but we still are not able to use that as a primary diagnosis. Um, I believe that is article (laughs) 62.85, I believe in the DSM. You sound like you made a video on the horror, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm guessing, but it's a 60 something. (laughs) Yeah, to be honest, I, I don't know because um, I I don't work with the DSM anymore. It uh, feels really good oh, not okay. to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, bless his heart for battling with Francis Liu to get that in there. It was the first recognition of any kind of spiritual or religious problem in the DSM that would not yeah. be medicated. Mm-hmm. It really was. But I haven't met a single psychiatrist that actually uses that criteria. I, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It was a good start, though. was actually, yeah, and his original intention was to get the whole uh, concept of spiritual emergency into the DSM, and they just kept scaling him back, scaling him back, scaling him back into something that really is removed from psychosis, if you read the details in the DSM. But that wasn't his intention. In- yeah. Yeah, I remember reading about that as part of my research, the process he went through. It's quite fascinating. But, uh, you know, it's a drop in the bucket and accounts for something. And if there's anybody who comes across that in the DSL, at least they'll begin thinking about alternatives. Yeah. You know, he started with this in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And the work, it, it sort of flows where you wouldn't expect it because very few people know about this, but some people do and they grow with it. and. I've made videos based on his work and you're inspired by his work and that's how this is going to turn around. And he, he told me in an interview, I said, so when do you think this is all going to change? And he looks at me and he says, one funeral at a time. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> in other words, we just have to wait for the powers that be to die 
And then the younger generation will get a little bit into positions of status or power and yeah. things up, you know? Wonderful. Yeah. 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 It's, you know, and it's, you know, call me an optimist, but I do think it's starting to happen. And I do think, um, you know, one of the ways it's starting to happen is the psychedelic renaissance that's upon us. You know, the more research that we're doing, that people are actually now inducing these altered states that could be and would be considered spiritual emergency or psychosis if they were induced in a research setting, but we're inducing them with the intention of supporting people's healing and transformation. And so, of course, people, not everyone, but some people are having mystical experiences as a result of it. And it's giving people a language that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So I do think it's starting to change and it's it's changing, I think, in large part because psychedelics are becoming mainstream and understood and um, given authority in the research world right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so how did you get interested in MAPS going, going from ASSIST <laughs> to MAPS? Or were you at ASSIST and MAPS at the same time or? You um, want to go to the other? yeah, it was actually, it actually just happened really smoothly. So, um, my, my board term was three years at assist. And as that was starting to wind down, uh, maybe this is another synchronicity people kept coming up to me, showing me the job description for, uh, the maps role and said, isn't this exactly what you're doing at assist? And I was like, yeah, actually sort of is, except we're working with people having broader experiences than just psychedelics. You know, we certainly worked with people who had psychedelic experiences and maps is more focused on the psychedelic uh, realm. And well, what was the job description? Well, at the time in early 2020, March, when I first applied, it was to be the director of harm reduction and going out to festivals and supporting in the Zendo project peer support tent. Um, and that was a way to really give people uh, a safe place to be held while they were having a, a trip that may not have been going so well. So giving them um, a safe place, uh, a sitter to sit with them and just making them comfortable getting their basic need met for quiet or water or just physical presence and safety, giving them a safe container. And what does Zendo come from? Where Where is that word coming from? The Zendo project uh, is called that because the, the maps, maps, which runs the Zendo project, uh, was given the space that they use, the physical yurt that they use at the festivals, uh, by a camp at Burning Man, who was, uh, I believe I'm saying this properly, a group of, um, Zen monks who used to use it as a meditation space. And so they gifted it to maps because maps had started this peer support tent. They gifted them the physical structure of this year. And so it became known as the Zendo Project. So a group of monks <laughs> um, had a Mongolian yurt that, how did the yurt get to Burning Man? Well, they were using it as their camp. My understanding is that that was their camp, that they had a meditation yurt that they would meditate in and people would come in and experience the meditations. And eventually they decided so the to monk the structure. Yeah. The monks were at Burning Man? Is that what you're telling me? The monks were at Burning Man. It attracts all the kinds. <laughs> okay. So, and these are Japanese monks or? Well, I, I can't, I can't tell you. I wasn't there. I don't know who exactly okay. it was, but um, and they then, were then practitioners. Okay. And then the yurt, they just started moving the yurt around going to raves and things like that. Is that the idea? Right. So when, uh, when when Zendo Project was contracted to come into a festival to support people in the psychedelic crisis, they would bring the structure to serve as the home base for people to come into and get cozy and safe. And so all of a sudden you go from getting your PhD to traveling to rave after rave after rave. <laughs> Well, not happened? quite. It didn't because I got the job August of 2020 and nobody was going anywhere. Oh, um, right. Because yeah, of the COVID. Yeah, exactly. So it, it was quickly, uh, I was honestly surprised if there was even still a job for me because I was, um, yeah, I, like I said, I, I started <clears throat> applying in March 2020. And by the time I was hired in August, the world was very different. Um, so yeah, we did we did basically some educational things and remote things, but uh, it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be in terms of traveling around to festivals, and uh, and that's okay because 
it really gave me an opportunity to start um, bridging the worlds of psychedelic and spiritual urgency and yeah. offering people uh, language and support for these crises within the psychedelic frame. Mm -hmm. And how how do you see supporting someone who's in psych in a psychedelic experience different from supporting someone in uh, spiritual emergence or spiritual <clears throat> emergence? Yeah, well, to be honest, just like there's no one type of spiritual emergence, there's no one type of psychedelic experience. So I think it's mm -hmm. the same spectrum of altered consciousness that we're working with. And the difference is maybe that somebody who's taken a substance, we have a sense of when that substance might uh, begin to wear off and they'll, they will come back to ordinary consciousness. Whereas somebody who's in a spiritual emergency process that is not elicited by a drug, we don't know necessarily when they're going to come out of it. So <clears throat> the, the acute phase of support looks very similar in that you're sitting with them, you're supporting them through the crisis. And uh, yeah, once the crisis is over, then you move forward into supporting them, integrating, making meaning of it, recognizing what lessons they want to take, what changes they need to make. So it's it's not all that different. I think they're actually very similar. Oh, okay. So, but yeah, with the spiritual emergency, you don't know how long you'll be there. I, I've had a few situations where in the middle of being a supporter, I start counting my underwear. Okay, <laughs> how many days... <laughs> how many days am I going to be with this person? <laughs> yeah. How many right. days of underwear do I need? <laughs> right. But yeah. So you, you started doing this work with maps and you got interested in the sort of difficult side of these experiences, right? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I had, uh, I guess even actually prior to my work with maps, I had begun working on a film project with um Kate West, who is somebody that I met uh, at a yoga studio at a Kirtan uh, workshop. And she comes to tell me that she's in the middle of her own nightmare Kundalini awakening. And <clears throat> at the time I had just finished uh, writing a dissertation about spiritual emergency and she was really pleased to come across somebody so randomly who understood what she was going through. And we became best friends and um, we actually started working on this film to support her in her process, which was to make meaning of what she was going through. She was really, had been in the process for a couple of years already. And <clears throat> the intention of beginning to work on this film was to give her answers and to help her come into some clarity about what she was going through. And so the, the film was really the beginning of um, the difficult side of these experiences. Um, the film is when lightning strikes and <clears throat> it's still uh, in production on pause at the moment. Uh, but, you know, the subtitle as of now is the unsexy side of awakening. So that was sort of the beginning of us talking about these difficult experiences. <clears throat> and the project I'm working on now is a challenging psychedelic experiences project. And that's a survey that I'm working on along with some researchers who are looking to explore adverse reactions to psychedelics specifically, uh, namely those that last longer than just the trip. So it's not for people who are having a so-called bad trip. It's for people who are having challenges a day or two later. So maybe they have associated or, you know, having some, some sort of symptoms um, after the drug has worn off. And yeah, we're looking to gather research to support people in understanding how to prevent those experiences moving forward, how to integrate them. And that's just getting started. So we have a survey that just launched last week about that. Cool. Do you want to get a glass of water? I feel like you're struggling with your <clears throat> cough a little bit. Yeah, sure. I'm only coughing because we're talking because I never cough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So maybe, maybe we'll take this. We're going to take a bit of a segue now. Okay. Go in a totally different direction. I'm with you. I think that this, I think this might be part of your process, you know, and okay. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because um, when I was, like I said before, when I was an English teacher and then this work with bipolar came up, and it really just took over my life, you know. Mm -hmm. And then one day I went to a, 
uh, student because I used to teach executives private classes and we would be, kind of become friends, you know, mm -hmm. teach people for a long time, sometimes a couple of years, see them once a week. If it's twice a week, I'm talking to them more than they're talking to their wives or husbands, you know. Yeah. Um, so you get to know people. And I was out for lunch with a, a student of mine and I start to tell him about my hospitalization. And I had never told anybody that I had this spiritual experience that got me in a psychiatric hospital. I'd never told anybody in a um, uh, professional setting about this. My yeah. old bosses never knew. Nobody I worked with ever knew. I was in the hospital and six months later, I'm back at work and people could see I'm a little different, but that's all they knew, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I start telling this guy the story about how I was put in the psychiatric hospital at, over lunch. Mm -hmm. And I start coughing and I start coughing and then I'm just hacking away. And we both recognized that it was related to the story. And he was like, it's okay. You can keep it to yourself. It's okay. And I think he really didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to see me like that. Okay. And, and I was like, no, I got to get this out. And I'm, I'm telling him the story and I'm just coughing the whole time. Wow. It was really obvious that it was a throat <clears throat> chakra. Yeah. Thing, you know? And I, and I think that, um, well, this is my projection on the whole thing Yeah, is that, you know, we're making a video on YouTube. People are going to see this video. You're talking about your experiences. Uh -huh. It's, it's, it's got to still feel personal. You know, you can feel like you're sure. kind of getting exposed. <clears throat> like, yeah. I think. Yeah, for sure. Huge it's courage. Sure. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for naming that. I hadn't really considered it, but it certainly makes sense. Um, it is personal and, and I'm happy to share my story because I want other people to feel like their story is normalized and that they could share their stories too, because that's how I think we're going to change the culture one story at a time. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be normalized. And, and there's people like yourself who've had these very um, spiritual emergence things that are life transforming, even though they happen for a second uh, and they never had any uh, negative implication for your life, like hospitalizations or losing relationships, right? Yeah. And then you have people at the total other end of the spectrum who see the spiritual dimension for sure, but they struggle with going in and out of the hospital. Um, and it can be very detrimental, you know, what, what happens to them. Yeah. And, and, and what I found, like when I was studying the work of Stan Groff, for example, and David Lukoff, there was much more of an understanding of like these two categories, you know, these two charts. Like if you're in chart number one, you're spiritual emergency. If you're in chart number two, you're bipolar. And it was only when I started the work in 2007 that I, I started to see that, wow, there's just this huge gray area mm -hmm. and there's this scale inside this gray area that almost everybody fits into that yeah. gray area. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and it's fascinating. And if we if we didn't have the lens of pathology, we might just approach all of these experiences as experiences that have potential, experiences that if we are supported and held through, really offer us an opportunity for something that we didn't previously know. But if we treat them as regressive and we treat them as something being wrong with us and they're held that way and validated that way by our cultures, um, it certainly doesn't support our growth. It supports us thinking something's wrong with us and it inhibits us from feeling comfortable exploring the, that new terrain, exploring the mind, exploring the consciousness that's coming up. Mm -hmm. Have you met um, Dr. Michael Cornwall? <clears throat> I have not. I have not. He's, he's in the Bay Area and, and he's worked in this area for decades, you know. And mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do an interview with him uh, in November. Uh, but one of the things we got around to in our conversation is that I think, you know, you've got the psychiatric world that just sees the whole thing as dangerous for your brain, biologically dangerous, for society dangerous. There's nothing of value, you know. Then we've got the spiritual emergency people who see the potential, the potential for growth, the potential for awakening and, and improving their lives as your life has improved and mine has as well. Um, what's really hard is to hold both camps in your head that it can be a potentially very dangerous thing for somebody, you know, to be in a non-ordinary state. If you're not supported in the right way, you're running, I've met guys who've 
God told them to go out and stand in the middle of the road and, and got hit by a truck, mm. you know, this kind of thing. And th But then the other side is, well, if you let this thing process, it can be really great for you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really hard to hold both of those perspectives in doing the work. Yeah. So my, my, my first rule when I started doing retreats, my first rule was stay out of jail. Do not go to jail. Because I thought, well, if something bad happens and I'm working in a country illegally, I could go to jail. Uh, um, so that was the priority. But And then help people as best you can. Mm -hmm. But that's number two. The first one was <laughs> this, this kind of thing, stay out of jail. I'm glad you've managed to stay out of jail so, so far. I have. I have barely managed to stay out of jail. <laughs> it's, it's happened, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you're getting back to your work <laughs> with the psychedelics and sort of these difficult experiences, conservatively, I think 50% of the people who contact me and have been diagnosed with bipolar had used psychedelics prior, some kind of psychedelic or mind, all, well, psychedelics or heavy mm -hmm. marijuana use. Right. 80% have used <coughs> heavy marijuana use or psychedelics before um, their first episode. Wow. I don't think that it's the sole cause of disorder. Right. Uh -huh. Usually the higher the drug use, the more traumatic the life. So the trauma is a big part of this, sure. but the psychedelic use is a big part of it too. Do you see a difference between um, somebody having this sort of difficult psych psychedelic experience um, and psychosis or is it the same? Huh. <clears throat> it's a good question. I mean, I don't have an answer for you. Um, Again, I think every individual's experience is so unique, um, and it really de depends. Well, how are we defining psychosis, right? If your definition is that it's an altered state of consciousness, then yes, every psychedelic experience that involves some hallucinogenic, you know, happening is psychosis. Um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. It's it's definitely curious territory. Um, and again, I think what's more important than the labels we assign them is the way that we hold them. So if we support somebody through mm -hmm. a difficult, quote unquote, psychotic experience, and if we support somebody through a difficult psychedelic experience, they're both going to yield better outcomes than if we pathologize them, punish them, isolate them, right? I think that's that's where we can stand with solid ground and less maybe in exploring the way we distinguish between them because i i don't really know what to tell you there i think it's it's really hard to be black sure. and white about that okay well it was always hard for me to be black and white about it too or yeah or to even know any sort of difference or a spectrum of difference because i've never done psychedelics i've never been that right. close to that world all i'm getting uh -huh. is second hand you know but sure. as a researcher, I was wondering if you had a different opinion than mine. And well, it doesn't seem like you know. it Yeah, I'll let you know what comes up from uh, from the research. We haven't started interviews yet, but I, I'm curious what will come up as we begin to get responses back and begin to do, dive deeper into interviewing people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how do you find these people? Like when you were in Sofia and you're at Sofia and you were interviewing people who had had spiritual emergence mm -hmm. and, and now with maps, how are you finding these people? It doesn't sound like I used to have a recruiter who would, who would, when I worked in advertising, who would put focus groups together for me. Right. I, I think it would be hard to have a recruiter finding people who had spiritual emergencies. Maybe not, maybe not, but I'm definitely down with the idea of trying to, to hire a recruiter. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, right now we're just putting the word out to people like yourself who have connections to these communities who come together over their shared experiences. So um, when I was doing my PhD research, it was similar. I went through Assist. I went through um, some of the Facebook groups where people were finding each other. I went to Chapel of Sacred Mirrors here in New York, causing, you know, people who were interested in psychedelics thinking i might meet some people there and uh, yeah and i did and so similarly now we're putting the word out to uh, various psychedelic organizations societies support groups um and anyone who just might happen to stumble upon knowing somebody who's had an experience that might qualify for the research mm. 
And you you mentioned there Chapel of Sacred Mirrors. Is that what it's called? Yes, I tell you. It's Alex Gray's little it, temple, yes, right? Exactly, right. Yeah. And we when we met in Prague in 2017, uh -huh. yeah. he was telling people about this place that he was opening up with his wife, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And have you visited there? Have you been there? So, yet? so yeah. So he's had the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors for quite some time. I know they started in New York City. They're now up in um, Wappinger Falls, New York. And I believe what he was talking about then is the uh, Theo, which is meant to be a separate space on his property, which is dedicated to bringing in other artists. So it's not just his work. It's also other artists as well as his work. And it's, it's just oh, okay. like a really beautiful creation. And they haven't formally had the opening yet, but I, I hear that it's coming soon. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it looks like something out of like ancient Egypt or something. It's like uh, really esoteric yeah. temple, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And what about your own experience with psychedelics? Do you do you partake? Well, right now I prefer to just talk about my experience supporting other people in theirs. And um, yeah, I think at the moment my my experiences with um, altered consciousness feel private to me, and I don't feel ready to talk about them publicly. Because, like I said, I I just don't. I think I'm too sensitive for the whole thing. And if I need to yeah. go into an ordinary state, I can just go to my room. I mean, it yeah. doesn't a lot. And I'm really glad you're saying that, Sean, because I think that to talk about harm reduction, this is something really important. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone should assume that just because they've had an experience with psychedelics that they want everyone to try. I don't think they should assume they're right for everyone. People like, like us who are, are naturally sensitive and have had many of these more spontaneous events happen, I don't think it's necessarily for us to partake when we can access the same states on our own. Um, many people I know, you know, in our community can access these states at will through uh, meditation practice or, you know, even the dream state. So it's certainly not for everyone. And this is part of what we hope to learn more about in this research too, is, you know, what are, because right now people who have any sort of, um, psychosis in their family or in their personal history are usually precluded from taking place in the psychedelic research that's out there, like for trauma and depression and whatnot. So we really don't know a lot, but we certainly know many people take things recreationally and that's what we want to get a better understanding of. Um, so hopefully I'll have more information for you about that, but I absolutely always defer to the person's inner authority. And if you feel like it's not for you, it's not for you. These medicines are powerful and varied and you really have to honor yourself and your truth and your inner knowing yeah and and i think part of the reason i think we're in a psychedelics phenomenon is people don't really realize their own spiritual dimension and how the intelligence works through you if people knew that they had a spiritual dimension just a normal regular and everybody does even idiots like Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, they have a spiritual dimension too. I'm mm -hmm. sure it's kind of dirty. It's not very nice, but it's there. Mm -hmm. um, and that through certain practices, it, you can access that safely. Yes. You know, and there, I think even since the sixties, the idea has been, and you know, Terrence McKenna, he believed that, uh, or he used to teach people that magic mushrooms were an alien intelligence that migrated to earth, came through space to, and that we were supposed to take these mushrooms to receive information from higher beings, you know? So there, and mother ayahuasca, like there's this idea that the intelligence is in the drug. And I think that's a really misleading interpretation of what's going on that the intelligence is like our deeper software it's it's underneath all the time and then we have our personality sort of sitting on top you know mm -hmm. uh, and then once once you can s settle down that sort of ego thing through either holotropic breath work or the various forms of breath work like i do or intensive meditation um those kind of practices can get you in touch with the same parts that you get in touch with, with psychedelics. Yeah. 
Absolutely. That's what I've seen so far. And yeah. it's a lot safer, you know, mm-hmm. because uh, there's a lot of people who are, who are getting hurt with psychedelics, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I guess the, the last thing to mention too, is that on, on the other hand, there is a, a positive side. And like when, when I was watching and reading Michael Pollan's book, uh on how to change your life or how to change how to your change your mind yeah mm-hmm. yeah and he's got a documentary on netflix and some of what he was saying i thought was really misleading like well if you're prone to schizophrenia don't do this but everybody else it's okay i mean nobody knows if they're yeah. prone to psychosis before it happens you know? yeah and so i thought that was deeply misleading but when they, he talks to people who have had uh, you know, MDMA, ayahuasca, and peyote, and mushrooms, and all these kind of things, they can't help but communicate a spiritual dimension. It's the, the experience. You know, mm-hmm. It's the experience. And in that way, I think more people being aware that these experiences are just a regular part of who we are, I, I think is very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely hear what you're saying. I think we have lost touch with our capacity to engage with the spiritual dimension within ourselves. And I think we're discovering, ironically, through the use of these substances, that it's the spiritual dimension that can be healing. And uh, which is why I think it's kind of fascinating that we're doing research on this area. I just came back from the Horizon Conference in New York this past weekend, which is a psychedelic medicine conference. And to hear a bunch of researchers and academics in a room talking about mystical experiences and the healing potential, to me, it's incredibly moving. Um, So I do think there's a lot of potential there. And I still say it's not for everyone. And, um, you know, just to note in terms of the safety of psychedelics over other spiritual practices, um, I think that, you know, Yes, medicine may have more potential for harm because we're dealing with with foreign substances, but also practices like meditation can offer challenging experiences when they're not held properly. You know, I know many people who've practiced, you know, a certain form of yoga and they've gone on to have Kundalini awakenings and their yoga teachers don't know the first thing to do with that. And there is no support for them. And they're just kind of left out there on their own. So. I would say any of these spiritual technologies can be dangerous and we need to treat all of them with reverence. And yeah, I hear what you're saying about psychedelics and also, you know, be mindful and learn what you can and develop community who really knows how to hold you before you go exploring altered states, period. Mm -hmm. I went to, uh, I didn't go, I talked to a guy years ago whose first psychosis happened at an ashram in India. And as they were taking him away, he told them, he said, I came here, you promised you were going to show us enlightenment. And now that I've got enlightenment, you're taking me to the psychiatric hospital. (laughs) Wow. It sounds like a joke, but it sounds like it's a real story. I mean, it's a joke and it's a real story. It's funny. It's sad. Yeah. Yeah. But it happens. And, And on the whole, when at the intensive retreats, Mm -hmm. um, where these things tend to happen in general, nobody knows what to do with you except call an ambulance. Yeah, exactly. Which is why we really need to teach the, you know, the people in the, in the medical framework of a better way to hold people so that they're not just receiving further trauma from their experiences, which often happens. And then the other thing too, is that when you're in a uh, intensive meditation retreat format, um, and most of the time, it's going to be within a religious context of some kind, you know, usually mm-hmm. with the Buddhists. Yeah. And, but in any religion, you're going to have forms of appropriate behavior, obedience, and things like this. Right. So when you do the Vipassana retreat, um, you, you know, you're not allowed to talk, you know, period. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a 10 day silent retreat. Yeah. So the minute you start making noises, you're disturbing people and you're misbehaving and they look at you like you're misbehaving. And so it's not a safe therapeutic container to mm-hmm. go through an experience where you need to do some screaming and contorting on the ground. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you there. Containers are very important. And I think we're, we're definitely lacking the containers for these experiences, which is something I hope that we'll get better at as we 
for giving ourselves more permission to talk about them and explore what's needed to have a full, healthy experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, therapeutic containers. I mean, wow, if we had some of those around, like if that was normalized, you know, yeah, just like mm -hmm. you were saying, we'd be in a much better place. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, I wanted to ask you for people listening at home who are thinking about pr probably trying psychedelics who have had some experience in this, if you could explain what you think is a safe way to go about using psychedelics as opposed to the typical way that people use them, which is in a really like informal setting or at a party or a rave or something like that. Yeah, well, I think the intentional use of psychedelics is something that um, it's best we pay attention to you, uh, like with any drug, uh, knowing your set and setting, testing your medicine, knowing your guide, knowing any potential contraindications that from other medicine you might be taking for health concerns. Um, sometimes diet beforehand plays a role in the experience that you're going to have. So really doing your homework and being intentional with your choice to use psychedelic medicine is really gonna impact the experience you have. So I think, yes, it's true that the, we're hearing a lot about the benefits of psychedelic medicine in the research, and we have to remember that's a controlled setting. And while as of now in the US, pe many people are not able to access these studies and might be wanting to try these medicines on their own, um, yeah, we need to be mindful of the risks that can occur. So doing it in a proper way, understanding the, potential concerns and navigating responsible use is really important to pay attention to. Well, I had one more thing on my list here. We have a mutual friend in Jules Evans. Yeah. Jules edited the book Breaking Open and I was in the book and I've interviewed Jules mm -hmm. and you're, um, you're working with him? Yeah, so he he's actually the one who instigated the research project that we're doing on challenging psychedelic experiences. So yeah, we are working together with a team of researchers to yeah get this survey out and start making um, getting more information so we can support people in understanding adverse reactions and in integrating them. Okay. Yeah, and he's had one himself. That's he writes a chapter right. in the book Breaking Open about his yeah. own. Uh, I think his started with ayahuasca too. Yeah, that's and right. Had the the double whammy of psychedelics plus international travel equals yeah. a journey <laughs> trouble. That'll do it. Yeah, it's trouble. It, it, and it's weird, but when you think about it, like okay, psychedelics big trigger for psychosis. Mm -hmm. Intensive meditation retreats, big trigger for psychosis. International travel is a big trigger for psychosis. Mm -hmm. Many people, their first experience happens when they're traveling to a culture very different from their own. So yeah. the most common place for that to happen is India. Because, you know, India for a Westerner just often blows their mind wide open and they've got right. a wide range of sort of thoughts around India. And it's just a huge cultural difference. And they, they can feel like they're closer to spirit and things like that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, right? You're really visiting another realm. Yeah, yeah, you're in another world. And it all three break down the ego, you know, yeah. but through different means, right? We're all mm -hmm. just breaking down our ego functioning. And then that's when these things happen. This is my thinking. And then if we break, if the breakdown happens too deeply or, or it's too much, then it goes into spiritual emergency mm -hmm. um, where you can't integrate and you start to think you're dreaming right? And or you're dead like I did. I thought I was dead. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're in trouble, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some trouble with our world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, this has been great. It's great to hear about what you're doing. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really happy to reconnect with you, Sean. And um, yeah, I think I would just encourage people, if you know someone who's had an adverse psychedelic experience, to check out the um, Challenging Psychedelic Experience Survey. Um, and I'll also mention um, Elizabeth Shabet and I. Elizabeth and I worked together at Assist uh, for several years. She was the president um, for I think seven seven years for a long time, 
And we're actually going to be working together to offer a spiritual integration coaching program, and it'll be geared toward therapists offering continuing education units and also for coaches, really helping people to understand how to work with people who are in a spiritual crisis and what they might need. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, you can uh, reach out and get more information. Wow. So this is a whole training program the two of you have put together for people. Yes. Yes. So Elizabeth has been working with it for some time with her coaching school and she's invited me in this, this year to help bring it to more therapists as well. Okay. And when people participate in this, do they, is it just their own volition that they go or are they, are they, do you, do you train organizations yet or is it more people who want this so they're doing it for themselves yeah so far it's individuals but i love the idea of training organizations i wish there were more organizations who were interested in getting trained in this because it's certainly a skill for the world that we are living in and that we are creating and building into more every day so yeah it can, it can be for everyone but it is geared toward individuals who are interested in supporting people going through spiritual transformation Okay, so they they know about the subject matter before they get to you. You're not oh, not necessarily not necessarily. I mean, they might have okay. a curiosity, but the program is very comprehensive in that it will break down what is a spiritual crisis, how do we work with it, the do the don'ts, the in between, the ethical considerations, especially if you have a professional license. Uh, so yeah, it's it's intended yeah. for people who have maybe a coaching or a therapeutic background. But it's also um, for people who are, you know, interested in working with people of, uh, you know, getting more skills in how to work with people on a spiritual path who might be going through a crisis. Mm -hmm. You brought up something really interesting there for a second yeah. about licensing. Mm -hmm. Is there a risk? Do you think there's a risk in the United States where people can be sued just for crossing the street the wrong way. You know, I, I mean, you can be sued for anything in the United States. Um, I'm in Brazil. People don't get sued that yeah. way. <laughs> but um, are there, are there, do you feel like there's risks or even for your own career in being in the area that you're in? Or have you, have, do you give well, it much thought? I, I don't, I think there's risks in, in having no competency in this area. So for me personally, I mean, that's why I'm really an advocate for giving therapists, coaches, health and professionals, a language and a skill set around this. I think there's much more risk in not being able to meet people with these challenges. Um, but yeah, in terms of licensing risk, I think it's just things to be mindful of when you're working with somebody in a spiritual crisis, you know, how to approach what the recommendations of your unique profession are and discerning what this person's needs are and whether you're the appropriate person to help them. And are you still practicing within your scope? if you're incorporating some of this. And so, yeah, it's complex, it's individualized, and ideally we're gonna get all of these licensing realms to recognize what we're talking about so they can include it in their learning objectives for the people who are licensed with them. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, and I, I think this came up in a previous interview. It's this whole thing culturally where it's like, if you have a client um, that goes to a psychiatrist or somebody who's in a distressed state and they go to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist medicates them and then the person commits suicide. Yeah. Well, they go back to the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist can say, I follow protocol because yeah. this is the protocol and he's protected. But mm -hmm. if you treat that another way and perhaps you're not so encouraging for medications immediately or, or, or less or something like that and you mm -hmm. go a different way and they commit suicide, then you're on the hook. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. It can be, yeah. it can be in a different situation. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a complex world and there are no guarantees, but I, I always think having more understanding and more knowledge in this area will help you make better decisions when you're working with people. Because the truth is I've met many, you know, many people who've experienced trauma as a result of speaking with their doctors, their psychiatrists, their therapists, and being, you know, pathologized and erroneously medicated. And to me, I think that trauma that is inflicted by those of us in the system is worse than not educating ourselves about alternatives that can be complements to working within the system. I really think there's a way you can do both and do it well and be in a space where you're serving people and reducing harm. Sure. And being medicated, but being hospitalized is just like, 
Yeah. It's a very traumatizing experience to go through because you're so, yeah. it's such a hostile environment and you're so energetically open, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then it's just like, it's being hit, like hit with a sledgehammer or something. You know? Yeah. So it's yeah. tough. Yeah. Okay, Katrina. Well, thank you very much for uh, being here and having this great talk about your experience and where you're taking this in a, in a real clinical direction, institutional direction. That's going to help a lot of people for sure. And if anybody's interested in learning more about Katrina Michelle, they can check out her website at thecuriousspirit.org. Right? That's Got it. That? Yeah. Correct. Okay. It's it's not the Australian online liquor store. It's a different Curious Spirit. Thecuriousspirit.org is what you want. Yeah. But of course, you know, spirits come to us in in many forms, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thanks, and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Sean. Bye.